Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm really excited for today's guests, just selfishly, because of, I, I don't know, Scott, how many podcasts have we done? A thousand? Between the uh, three podcasts? I, I don't know, man. I was, I was, actually, it's funny, because I was trying to figure that out today. I don't even know where I'd begin to, I don't even know where I'd begin to look. I don't know. Let's just say a lot. A lot. And this is the first time we've had a guest in this niche, I'm getting tingly thinking about it. So I'm really excited. But before we talk to our guests, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host, the professor, the brain, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if you're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Just a reminder, today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. If you want Scott Todd to lead you, the Sherpa, the, uh, who was, uh, who was Hill, Edmund Hillary's Sherpa? What was his name? Tenzing Norgay? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, if you want him to lead you up the mountain quickly, efficiently, profitably, don't waste time. Learn more about flight school. Go to landgeek.com forward slash training. Schedule a call with Scott Bossman or Mike Zeno. Our guest today is Chris Raleigh from harvestreturns.com. Chris is the CEO of harvestreturns.com. This is a company that uh, does capital raises for small to medium-sized operators in actually private investments in production farming. Production farming. What? Chris Raleigh. You woke up one day and said, you know what? Farmers, agriculture, I can help them. Yeah, more or less. Uh, that that's what we did. But uh, kind of a long and windy road to get to um, starting this company, Harvest Returns. I have been a real estate investor for a long, long time. I um, and my career started uh, in the military. I've been an active in Reserve Navy officer for about twenty five years. So I spent a lot of time traveling around the world. And one thing, yeah, I think I've been to fifty something countries. One thing I've seen every place I go as there are two essential industries on earth. One is real estate. People have to live somewhere. And the other is food. People have to eat. And, and you know, coincidentally, those are both based on land. Uh, people have to have a place to live and grow their food. And no matter where I've gone, no matter how poverty stricken um, the country, people are raising livestock or growing something, fruits and vegetables, that sort of thing, so that they can eat so that they can feed people and so that they can make money. And so as a real estate investor, you know, I've done land, I've done residential, commercial, real estate, um, worked in that industry for, for a, a time and, and invested a lot in my own account. Um, several years ago, because of this sort of notion that, that agriculture is sort of a universal need, I became interested in investing in it. Um, but when you start to figure out uh, how to invest in a farm and, and you look into it, it's not really an easy thing. I was talking to a banker about a month ago and he said that the average farm, I think in North America or the U S is, is valued at about four and a half million. So this is not something you just go out and write a check for, even if you've got that kind of capital laying around, um, you've got to have the knowledge, you've got to know what you're doing. Uh, most farms in the U S are family farms. So there's a kind of factory industrial farming gets a, it's a bad rap, but there most farms are family farms. So you want to invest in this. There's not a lot of ways to do it. So a few years ago, we, my uh, COO and I, Austin Manis, conceived this idea to combine uh, online investing, equity crowdfunding with passive investments in production agriculture, and that's what how we started Harvest Returns. You know, Chris, I hate to do this to you, but my, my internet just kind of froze. There. Can you go back just a sentence and say how you started Harvest Returns? Um, yes. Okay. So a few years ago, uh, based, based on this desire to make agricultural investing more easily, my uh, COO, Austin Manis, and I, started this company, Harvest Returns, which is an online platform that enables people to invest in agriculture. Okay, great, great. Scott Todd, you know, Chris kind of has like a, that, that little niche where, you know, nobody wakes up and thinks to themselves, boy, I'd love to invest in a farm today, a family farm. 
Yet, to his point, this is a massive market and massive opportunity. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, Chris, I was, I'm kind of curious, like, you know, how, how is it that you go about and like find, find investors that like, and educate them? Because like for me, and look, I, I'm going to tell you, I'm being naive when I say this, but like, when I think of like farming, I know it's, essential, but man, like whenever I think about farming, I think of like um, the struggles that you hear about on the media about, you know, how difficult farming is, how, you know, how the, the economics don't really make sense without government subsidies. And, and look, I've never gone down this path to look at it. So I'm, I'm saying this from a naive standpoint, but like, to me, I would look at that and I'd go like, ah, eh, I don't know about that. But like, how is it that you educate investors on this when it seems to be like, it's pretty unique. Yeah. Education, Scott, is a, is a huge part of what we do because it is a new asset class for most people. And, and I think most people, when they think about farming, they're, they're thinking about driving, you know, just to visit grandma at Thanksgiving and they're driving through wheat fields or soybean fields or corn fields. Um, just long, as far as you can see, pastures of, of food growing. And those are those, those commodity based crops. And those are, uh, uh, yeah, quite frankly, commodity farmers in the, the U.S. in the past few years have had lots of issues because there's been a long-term slump in those those prices. But um, agriculture is a really wide-ranging subject, and the, the type of offerings that we're really focused on, although we, we certainly um, want to work with with those commodity-based farmers, that the, the type of placements that we put on the platform are more specialized. So when you think of indoor agriculture, new ways of growing food, whether it's hydroponics or aquaponics or aquaculture, people are growing food closer to the consumer and, and that can be grown at higher margins. People are focused now on really specialized um, types of livestock like grass fed, grass finished cattle, um, cage free chicken eggs, those sorts of things where the margins are higher. So although, um, yeah, there are a lot of government subsidies in agriculture, it, it's, it can be profitable if you know what you're doing and if you, you structure the investment correctly. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I mean, when I think of, uh, you know, profitable um, land, you know, kind of like a bond, I think of Timberland, I think of a Buffett and farmland, you know, 8%. Is that something that you guys look at as well? Or do you, like what you said, think really outside of the box? Yeah, we're doing a little bit of, of, of both and, and everything. Um, some of our, our offerings are, are in the U.S. and sort of more generic and, and other ones are, are outside the U.S. and more, more specialized. And yeah, there's that sort of bond base. Um, you know, the best, best way to get in farming is really to go out and, and buy a piece of land and, and pay somebody to farm it. But that takes a lot of capital, um, debt and equity. And one of the things we do is, is we help bring together investors who will put equity into a, an established farmer's project or help him expand into a, a, a larger piece of land or, or put some infrastructure to help them achieve those economies of scales. Because as, as th these family farmers, these farms are growing the average size of the farm is growing and that's because the farmer today is not just competing uh, to sell his say soybeans or his his organic tomatoes in the next county but you know with that that same grower that's in brazil or you know somewhere else that, that they're bringing in those uh, that organic produce so it's it's a very competitive industry uh like a lot of industries uh, but there are ways to to invest in it profitably so if we were going to be really savvy investors, Chris, what would be the due diligence questions we'd want to ask to become more educated? So if we're looking at fund A that mm -hmm. invests in agricultural and fund B that, uh, that, funds, that, that does it, what are the questions that we want to ask so that we kind of fill in this gap? Like we know we know, we know we don't know, but we don't, what we don't know we don't know is where we get killed. Right. So uh, these are the types of questions we ask when we're betting offerings for our platform. And the first is get to know who your, your sponsor is or who the, who the farmer is. You know, what is their background there? Are they a multi-generational farmer? Are they, do they have a degree in ag economics? Have they been doing this for a while? So first off is, is do they know what they're growing, how to grow it? 
how to, how to actually be a farmer because because that's that's a one one part of the uh, equation. The other part is are they financially savvy? So we talk to a lot of people that are great at growing things, but they just don't understand the business side of things. And that we we try to help with that. But that's so so that sponsor vetting is a huge part. Then look at um, what's being produced and how it's being produced. So is it a commodity based crop? Are you investing in something like just land with soybeans where it's going to be very dependent on the overall commodity price on possibly tariffs and trade, some of those, those issues that are going on right now, or are you investing in something that is a high demand crop or a growing market crop right now? So hemp is something that everybody's talking about right now because the farm bill last year was just passed and there's a tons of CBD based products that are, are derived from that hemp production. And that's a, a really growing industry. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the indoor agriculture aspect of growing food closer to the consumer it takes less water, less energy to get it to the consumer. It can be more specialized. You can grow year round in all types of climates. The risk in those investments are a lot lower because you're not dealing with drought. You're not dealing with, um, in, insect infestations and things like that compared to growing outdoors. So there's, you, you basically, the, the main due diligence, the, you know, the, the bottom line to your, your question is, is get to know what's growing and how it's growing. And there's some ways to do that. We produce a lot of content and educational products that kind of bring somebody who just is a food consumer uh, and transforms them into a food investor. I love it. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? No, I, th I think it's, uh, I mean, I'm really, I'm really like taken back by the whole thing because I, I haven't really thought about this at all, right? Like it's, it's really a cool process to hear. Um, I'd love to hear kind of more about like the, the crowdfunding that you're doing and kind of that, like, are you using a, an established platform or are you, you know, how are you like kind of getting the investors into the, in, into your system? Yes, yeah, so we're definitely doing, uh, you know, a form of, of crowdfunding uh, without getting too uh, geeky on the regulations. We do Reg D offerings, which is primarily um, offered to accredited investors, but but not entirely. Um, we're not doing this Reg CF crowdfunding, which is every retail investor for say a hundred dollars pop, five hundred dollars pop, because it's just not. What after kind of studying that, it's not feasible. But our, our platform does uh, allow an investor to come on and soup to nuts, uh, research the investment, review the offering documents, sign the offering documents, uh, make the investment, transfer the funds into escrow, close the investment, get regular updates, get your tax uh, documents, and get your receive your distributions as the um, operation. So it's very similar to the real estate crowding funding platforms that are out there, which, uh, you know, probably many of your listeners are familiar with. There's dozens, literally dozens and dozens of them, um, much less so though on the production agriculture side. And we, um, we have different offerings and our minimum investment minimums are, are something that we're proud of. Uh, you can invest in a farmland fund. And there's some REITs out there and those investments, um, they, they range, they vary. They're a hundred thousand, 250,000, but our platform, our offerings are in the five to $25,000 minimum investment. So it's a good way for someone who's not familiar with the asset class to kind of dip their toes in the water and, and diversify their portfolio and, and receive that passive income from these projects. You know what, I, you know what I, I want to, why I want to invest in this fund, Chris? Why is that Mark? Cause I feel disconnected. Like I go to the grocery store, and I buy the food. I never think about how in the heck did this food get into this grocery store? And I feel like this would be a way to bridge that gap where I would be a little bit more connected to the farmer that's going through all this labor to keep me and my family alive. Like just that aspect alone, I think selfishly would be cool. And then the second aspect is like, let's like, even if we take it a step further, like, okay, we've all heard about CBD oils, right? And we see them on the things, but we have no idea how does that even happen and the benefits of that. And um, there's a lot of science on the benefits of CBD oil um, for lots of maladies. So I think it's really one of those things where it's kind of like the Tom's shoes of funds, right? Like you just feel good investing in it versus say, you know, uh, maybe just a, a commercial project where 
you know, oh, I make, you know, 8% and somebody's living in this apartment complex and I have you know, no connection to it. Oh, there's, there's our company. We own, you know, 0.05% of it. Um, so do you get, Chris, do you get a lot of people who are, you know, motivated not just by their turn, but the fact that it connects them back to the earth? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you just kind of described our mission statement to, to connect farmers, to invest investors, connect uh, investors to the food system, and bring them closer. And yeah, the, um, we define most of our projects as a sustainable agriculture. And there's a lot of different ways you can define that. Uh, you can define, define it as environmentally friendly. You can define it as key social aspects where you're, you're keeping, say, American farmers farming and you're, you're bringing jobs to these rural areas that have been you know, depressed compared to, to the growth we see in urban areas. And, and then obviously it, it needs to be economically sustainable and economically viable and, and produce a nice return. So there's, there's farmers or there's investors that we've spoken to that, that are really into sustainable agriculture and, and, and you know, feel proud to own a piece of a farm, whether it's in the U.S. or West Africa or or South America or wherever, and, and help keep those uh, farmers in what's arguably the, the most important industry in the world, because we are all consumers of this industry. Um, there, there's no way to avoid it. Yeah, you're, you're wearing products of agriculture, you're drinking products of agriculture, and obviously you're eating them. And it's, you know, it's, sometimes it's in our our houses uh if you if you include timberland as as part of that and in our clothes and all that kind of things right right can you kind of talk a little bit about and i can see scott's got a question no scott, you go, ahead, no, go ahead go ahead go ahead I, I just want to ask him about opportunity zones and yeah. why you know you every time i go to a, a real estate anything all you know inevitably somebody brings up the opportunity zone yeah, so this is something that's that's really exciting for us. We are putting together an Opportunity Zone Fund. It's going to be the first, if not one of the first, Opportunity Zone Funds uh, focused, in ours is focused on sustainable agriculture. And most of the uh, OZF's Qualified Opportunity Zone Funds that we've, we've learned about are focused on real estate. So that's great. Um, you know, people have to have some place to live in apartment buildings and, and renovating them and bringing jobs to um, urban areas, but about half of the 8,700 opportunity zones in the U.S. are in rural areas. And so obviously what happens in rural areas is, is agriculture. And, and I think what's exciting about them from an investor standpoint is just the tax advantages. I think most people are probably familiar with 1031 exchanges and they're, they're kind of tricky to do a 1031 exchange successfully. You got to have a like kind asset, but these opportunity zone funds, the rules are much more flexible. So you can defer the capital gains from the sale of any kind of asset. So it can be land, it can be uh, an apartment building, it can be stocks or a business even. Um, and you've got a much longer time period, I think 180 days and you defer those. It's a, that, that they're pretty complicated rules and you've got to kind of follow along. So you can defer those uh, recogn recognition of those taxes until December 31st, 2026. But if you hold that uh, investment and opportunity zone for five years, you get a tax basis step up of 10%. You hold it for seven years, you get a 15% step up. And then sort of the, the real kicker is that any gains made on that initial investment into an opportunity zone fund, you don't pay any ca capital gains on them. Uh, the post acquisition games, if you hold it for 10 years. So it's definitely a long term investment. But I, I we've talked to a lot of investors who are really excited about this. Um, one, because it, yes, it's, it's a great way to, to sort of shield your, your gains from taxes, but also because, you know, they're passionate about what we're, we're doing with, with sustainable agriculture and bringing these jobs into these rural areas, uh, growing food in new ways and interesting ways and all that kind of things. Scott Todd. Hey, Scott, you're on mute. Sorry about that. The, the zones that, that we were just discussing, that those... It's, it's funny to see how the application of those is uh, kind of expanding. Like they, they were getting ready to build a uh, stadium here, like a baseball stadium here in the Tampa area. And they were going to use a, you know, a, a, a zone fund, mm -hmm. if you will, to, to raise the private equity, which they did. Uh, I think the stadium kind of fell through. But essentially, it's, it's interesting to see the, the opportunities and the dynamics at play for like what you're doing with the sustainable portion of that. 
Yeah. Um, very familiar with Tampa. I used to live there for several years, so I know what you're talking about. Yeah. All right, Chris, let's just pretend that, you know, we're family. You're my brother-in-law. We're at a party. We're drinking a few beers, right? And you come up to Scott and I you're like, guys, I know the future. I see it. Like, you know, that, that scene in, uh, what, what was that movie? Dustin Hoffman, like his first movie. Uh, Mrs. Robinson, Kukachu. What was that movie? <laughs> the the Graduate. Wait, was that the Graduate. You? The Graduate. <laughs> the guy go, goes up to office and he's like, plastics. Yeah. All right, just between us. right? And nobody's listening, by the way. Nobody. No one's listening. Just, you know, several million people. Um, what's, what's the next big opportunity in agriculture? Is it, is it CBD? Is it hydroponics? Is it, what is it? So I mentioned hemp, so I'll skip over yeah. that one. That is, that is hugely growing. But I think it's what I call decentralized agriculture or urban agriculture. Uh, not necessarily urban. That, that's one form of it, suburban. Um, the, the vision that I sort of see with agriculture is related to the, sort of the, the decline in retail. So you have all these empty Sears and Toys R Us and and buildings all over the country, right? They're just sitting empty in areas that you've still got, um, you know, you've got people that you need to feed. So why aren't we turning some of these buildings into indoor agriculture projects? And, I, and, and that's happening in some places, but I see more and more of that happening. So you are, instead of continuing to expand development and, and cut down trees and, and take away sort of native territory to produce arable land, why don't we take what we already have in these, the form of these sort of discarded buildings and repurpose them? So that's what I'm excited about. Right, right. Now at the risk of Scott Todd rolling his eyes, I've got to mention the word climate change. What's, I mean, is this something that can derail any ag investment? Look at Scott. Scott, I'm just joking. I know you're you're not really rolling your eyes. I'm not rolling my eyes. No, I'm. Not it's a it. thing. It, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know this is a risk management thing to me. If you just putting on the investor hat, um, yeah, the climate changes. The climate's always change, always going to change. Um, indoor agriculture, uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep harping on that. That's one way to mitigate potential for changing climates because you're you're not reliant. You're using much less water. You're doing it in a controlled environment. Um, you're growing food closer to the consumer, so you don't have to burn as much fuel to get it to where it's consumed. And yes, yeah, sure, maybe you are, could invest in a project in a certain geographic area where 20 years from now that there's not enough water or enough um, to grow something. But at the same, you know, one person's risk is another person's opportunity. So now there's probably places that are more north that you can grow have a longer growing season so it's like anything else you, you, it's there is location 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 is important with agriculture just like it's important in um, real estate investing yeah absolutely um last question before we get to the tip of the week let's say scott and i invest in hemp right now if we were farmers and we were we were actually farming hemp the way that we would sort of mitigate a bad season or bad harvest, if you will, is to, um, you know, short the commodities, right? So now we're hedging our bet on uh, the commodities exchange, which is, you know, like with an option. So is this something that you guys also say, okay, if you're going to invest, you're a credit investor, you're going to invest $100,000 in this fund. In exchange, you might want to buy an option here. Uh, you know, and, and mitigate it and cover your, you know, the downside on a, on a bad harvest? So that's a great question, Mark. We certainly wouldn't discourage our investors from doing that if they had a large, large enough position in a particular offering to make it worth their while. Say we had a pure soybean offering. Well, yeah, you should probably hedge that. But what we, rather what we do is we encourage the farmers to hedge and to put, put risk mitigation um, measures into place, whether it's uh, crop insurance, you mentioned hemp. Well, part of the 2018 farm bill was to allow crop insurance 
um, on hemp. So that's, that's a big deal. And, and then the other way to mitigate the risk is via hedging, hedging via futures. And there's more and more of those. Um, it's not just the commodity crops anymore. And we have some partners that will help our farmers, uh, service providers that will help our farmers hedge those risks so that you as an investor and, and the final way is to diversify, right? So don't put all your eggs in one basket. And that's kind of the beauty of our platform and our offerings is you don't have to put your life savings into one investment that's going to have a high risk. Um, you can you can diversify not only, you know, your portfolio, whether it's real estate, gold, silver, stocks, bonds, whatever, put, put some of it into natural resources, farming and agriculture, but also across projects. So I think um, that diversification is what what protects your your principal and your risk. I love it. All right. Well, Chris, we're at that point now in the podcast. I think this has been phenomenally uh, enlightening. And uh, what a great idea, by the way. I'm Scott, we should have thought of this years ago. <laughs> it's definitely unique. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So what is your tip of the week? A website, a resource, a book, something actionable for the Art of Passive Income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? So thanks. I, you know, I, there's a lot of books that I like to recommend and that I've read and that have kind of shaped the way we do things in, in the company here. But um, yeah, one of them is the lean startup by Eric rise. And that's just how to, how to start a company on a shoestring budget and be agile and um, learn how to experiment and iterate and improve constantly. And so that's, if you're starting a small business, I think lean startup is, is a good place to start. All right. I've read it. It's a great book. Great book. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Mark, I had a situation uh, in the last few days where I actually needed to share with somebody a, um, a large, pretty large file. So I needed to share with them like a, it worked out to be like an 80, I don't know, like an 86 gig file. And there's no, uh, sorry, 86 meg, apologize, 86 meg file. There's no way of, of uh, kind of sharing that through email. And I needed to be a little bit more secure. I didn't just want to put it in Dropbox or whatever. So essentially what I did was I found this website called Hightail.com. Hightail.com. H-I-G-H? H-I-G-H-T-A-I-L. And so what that does is I got the free free plan. You can pay monthly if you want, but the free plan gives you a file up to 100 gig, 100 meg, sorry. And essentially what that does is it provides it in a secure format. So I provide the, the email that I'm sharing it with. They get notified that they have this email. I can put in there an expiration date if I want so that it expires out. I get a email that confirms that it was delivered to their email address. So no more of this like, oh, well, oh, I had the wrong email address. I know I got to the right place or a valid email address. And uh, it's worked out pretty well. So check it out. Huh. If you need a large file set and you want it secured. Well, what's different than like say we transfer. Is this, is this better than we transfer.com? I'm not never heard of it. So I'm going to say yes. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's check out we transfer. Chris, do you want to weigh in on this? No, I, you know, we send a lot of documents back and forth securely. So I'm going to give those a try. Um, okay. So we transfer sends up the two gig free. And this does a hundred meg free. Otherwise it's 12 bucks a month for 25 gig. Okay. But you do get tracking. This is pretty good. Yeah. Either way, check them out. All right. Nice. Check them both out. Well, my tip of the week is learn more about Chris Raleigh and you know, the way that he's actually improving our, our lives by raising capital and helping out farmers that are doing, you know, amazing things and, you know, connecting us back to the earth. Learn more at harvestreturns.com. Harvestreturns.com. We will have a link to that. And um, I'm, I'm personally interested in, uh, in learning more. So I can't wait to get an offering, Chris. Um, and as long as it, you know, I get a better return than whatever Scott Todd's investing in, that's really all I care about. <laughs> It's all about keeping up with the Joneses. Keeping up with the Todds. Absolutely. The Todds. So Chris, are we good? Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. Great. Scott, Todd, are we good? Mark, we're great. 
Well, I want to thank all the listeners. I just want to remind you the only way, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Chris Raleigh from harvestreturns.com is if you do us three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast, send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit course. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody and let freedom ring. Thanks everybody.